but we're going to create our first unit test, our first J unit test class. So let's switch to the project window for BlueJ. I'm going to click and drag my car class away from the other things a little bit. Um, if you right click on the car class in the project window, the last menu option says create test class. So choose that. And what should appear when you choose that is a little green rectangle behind the orange rectangle, which represents the test class associated with the car class. Um, and if we double click on that file, we can see that BlueJ generated a whole bunch of code to help us get started with our test. Okay. It imported a bunch of things that we need. It created a little documentation header here at the top. I'm at least going to change this to have my name in it. So let me add that in. I'm going to ch change it to today's date. Um, to be clear, this is a class just like the class we wrote. Right? We still have public class car test. The name of the test class will always be the name of the class we're testing with test on the end. It wrote a default constructor for us which we're not going to mess with. It has this method called setup and teardown, which we're not going to worry about right now. We're just going to add some additional methods at the end of this class. We saw some tags yesterday that we used with javadoc, at param, at return. There's some new ones here, at before, at after, okay. Um, we're not going to worry so much about those, but we are going to use the tag at capital T test, and then we're going to put, we're going to define a method that will will test a method in the car class. So let's start by testing a relatively simple method. Let's test the get fuel and tank method. So all of our test methods will be public. They will all have a return type of void. They will all start with the word test by convention. And after test, the rest of the method name is going to be the name of the method we're testing. This makes it really easy to like line everything up. So this is going to be test get fuel in tank. We, will have, we won't have any parameters for any of our test methods either. So it's always public, it's always void, there are never parameters, and it's called test and the name of the method we're testing. Here is a potential challenging part. This is what I alluded to yesterday that makes this unit a little hard. We spent the last day and a half defining the car class. Now we need to do that context switch to use the car class. Right? We got to switch from definition world to usage world because now we need to actually create a new car object. And then we need to use that car object to see like, hey, does it work? So we're going to create a local vari variable of type car and call it test car. That's our local variable. And we're going to assign it a reference to a new car. So this is us doing the usage stuff like we did in the last unit. We're not defining things anymore. We do have more insight now than we had before. We now know that when we say new car, what happens is it does go find a chunk of the computer's memory to store our car object and all of its attributes. Um, but it also, the way it does that is it calls the constructor that we just wrote in the other class. So we, we have a little more insight. All right, the purpose of this method is to see if the get fuel and tank method actually works. So let's, uh, let's try that. Let's create a local variable of type double, just called amount. And let's assign it the value returned by calling the get fuel in tank method um, on this new car. So the value of the variable amount is whatever this get fuel and tank method just returned on a brand new car. One really nice feature of JUnit is we don't have to write a lot of code to check and see if that value returned is what we expect it. Um, we can use a, a special static method. Um, and we'll explore more exactly how this works later. But for now, we don't need to call this method on any object. We can just say assert equals. 
This is part of the JUnit framework. Um, and we're going to pass in a, um, some parameters here. The first parameter is what is the value we expect? So if we just created a brand new car, how much fuel do we expect is in the tank? Well, we expect it's empty. We expect that there are zero gallons in the tank. The second argument that we're passing is, um, well, what did the method say? What's the actual value? What's the return value? Well, it's whatever is stored in the variable amount. If we were comparing integers, we'd be done, right? Because the number 7 equals the number 7, or it doesn't. Or if we're comparing strings, we'd be done. Either the strings have the same sequence of characters, or they don't. Doubles, or really anything that's in a floating point representation, is a little bit more complicated. Um, we'll explore this in more details in Chapter 4, but the way that a computer works is it can't possibly hold all real numbers. After all, there are an infinite number of them. And so it does some rounding. It has limited precision. As it does different mathematical calculations, and you might start getting some rounding errors that are compounding. Um, so if we want to compare two doubles, we don't necessarily mean they're exactly the same, because maybe one is 15, and the other one is 14.999999997. Those are pretty much the same. We want to treat them as equal. So when we use assert equals and we're dealing with floating point numbers like these doubles, we need to specify a third parameter, which is um, how close is close enough. Okay? If they're within this difference, we're going to consider them equal. In math class, uh, you may have heard of this referred to as like the epsilon. That's exactly the same concept here. So our epsilon value is going to be one millionth. We write this in scientific notation in Java, just like we do in Python, what, or just like you do on your calculator. 1e negative 6. And I'll put a little inline comment here. Scientific notation, 1 times 10 to the negative 6 power. So if these two values, if the difference between them is less than 1 millionth, we're going to consider that equal. That's plenty of precision for our purposes, right? We don't care about a millionth of a gallon of gas. Uh, this is what a test method looks like. We don't have to explicitly check it. We don't have to determine if the test passes or fails. All that's done by the assert equals method. So let's add a quick comment block just to capture what this does, because we're going to be writing a lot of assert equal methods. Um, so the assert equals method verifies that the expected value is equal to the actual what I mean by that is the value that's returned value. If not, the test fails. All done automatically. And we'll see this uh, later today or, or early tomorrow. Um, when we run our tests, if the test, if this assertion fails, and the word assert means like to assert means to make sure the following is true, confirm the following is true. So if our assert equals here fails, the test fails, and we get a nice report, tells us which test fails, tells us which assert equals fails, and it even tells us, like, hey, we expected this value, but we got this value instead. Okay? So in order for this really nice report to work, we need to make sure that we're careful that we always specify the expected value first and the actual value second. If we swap those two, the test is still going to fail, but the report's not going to make any sense. It's going to say, well, I expected A, but I got B, but in reality, like, those are backwards. So watch out for that. And then just to capture this epsilon thing, so for values of type double, and again, only for doubles, or only for floating point numbers. Then we're going to specify a third value, which is the epsilon. And again, what we mean by epsilon is how, this is not like a strict mathematical definition, how close is close enough to be equal.
Let's write one more oh, question. Yeah. Is it almost like a tolerance? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, if it's within this, it's okay. Yep. Let's write one more test method. I think we have time to just do one more, and we'll do the rest tomorrow. Um, eventually, we'll have a test method for every method in the car class. So again, at test, that's the tag that says, hey, this next method is a test. Run it when I tell you to. Always public, always void, always start with test. Let's test the add fuel method. No parameters. All right, this is a new method, so we need to create a new uh, car because we're going to have another local variable. I'm still going to call it test car. I'm going to say new car. We're not for this class. We're not going to explicitly write tests for our constructors, but let's make sure we actually exercise both constructors. So let's create a car that gets 50 miles per gallon. Uh, it also helps me do the math in my head. So. We want to actually test the add fuel method. And let's put 10 gallons of gas in our car. And then, and you'll notice this a lot, we can't test the add fuel method without also testing the get fuel and tank method. Okay? So I wrote that one first to make sure, like, okay, let's make sure the get fuel and tank method is working. But we're going to test the get fuel and tank method a lot more because we're going to be calling it in all the other methods. So let's call the get fuel and tank method on the new car. Um, and we're going to do another assert equals. But this time, we wouldn't expect it to be zero. We just put 10 gallons of gas in the car. We're going to expect that there are 10 gallons of gas in the car. And since it's a floating point number, we need to specify our, our epsilon. This is an OK test, right? If it passes, we have more confidence that we wrote it right. But part of the trick of writing tests is to be a little bit, um, kind of predict what type of bugs would be in the code and think strategically about that. So for example, maybe whoever implemented the add fuel method um, didn't add that fuel to what was already in the tank, but like replaced it. They just did an assignment instead. So let's, let's have a better test by actually calling the add fuel method again, and let's put in five more gallons. <laughs> and let's get the fuel in the tank now. And let's do another assert equals and make sure it's now up to 15. This is a better test. We're going to have a higher degree of confidence that the add fuel method works. We can have as many assert equals methods called within one of our test methods as we want. Um, you could put a dozen of them in there, and it's just fine. So we've tested the get fuel and tank method. We've tested the add fuel method. So the next method we want to test, let's test the actual drive method, the method where we report that the car is driven a certain distance, and we should update the fuel left in the tank accordingly. So as a reminder, we always start with at test. That tells the JUnit tool that, hey, this next method is a test method. Our test methods are always public. The return type is always void. Our test method always starts with the word test, followed by the name and the method we're testing. And we're testing the drive method. So we'll have test drive. And we never have any parameters either. This is going to be very similar to the previous test methods. We need to create a new car object so we can actually test if the drive method works correctly. So just like we did before, we'll create a local variable of type car called test car, and we'll assign it the reference return by creating a new car object. And let's uh, have this car also get 50 miles per gallon. A reminder that the, the argument to the constructor is how many miles per gallon the car gets. So there we are. Before we can drive the car, we need to at least put some fuel in the tank. So let's, on the test car variable, We'll call the add fuel method and specify 10 gallons. Now we're finally ready to drive. Okay, so the car is going to drive. Let's say the car drives 25 miles. And then 
we are going to see how much fuel is left in the tank. So again, we'll have a local variable of type double called amount, and we will call the get fuel in tank method, and it will return how much fuel is left in the tank. And then we can check if the amount of fuel left in the tank is what we expect with the assert equals. This is kind of like one of those factor label problems in chemistry or a dimensional analysis problem in physics or just a word problem in math. Our car can drive 50 miles for every gallon of gas. Okay? I used the for every in there, so some of you may appreciate that. Um, we drove 25 miles. How, much, how many gallons of gas did we consume? If we could drive 50 miles for every gallon of gas and we drove 25 miles, how many gallons of gas do we use? A half gallon of gas. Okay. So if we started with 10 gallons, we should have 9.5 gallons left. That is our expected value. Um, the actual value is going to be whatever value is stored in the variable amount. And since we're still dealing with floating point numbers, these are doubles, we need to specify that epsilon value, that how close is close enough. And this is a, this is a good test method to check if the drive method works as we intend. However, it could be better. Much like when we wrote the at test add fuel method, we hypothesized that depending on the bug, maybe we should call add fuel multiple times and actually verify that multiple times that it's working as it behaves or it's behaving as expected. We're going to do the same thing with the testing the drive method. Great, we called it once, but let's call the drive method again. Let's drive further and make sure that it still works. So let's drive another 100 miles. So we'll call the drive method and specify 100 miles. And we will, again, call the get fuel and tank method. I'm going to reuse the variable amount. Um, and that's fine. I can assign it a different value. I don't really care anymore what the old value is. We already did our assert equals. But I already declared the variable amount here by specifying its type as double. I would not declare it again. Okay? The Java, we're within the same scope. We're within the same method here. The Java compiler knows that this local variable amount is type double. I can simply reuse it. All right, but we don't expect 9.5 anymore. If we drive 100 miles and we can drive 50 miles for every gallon of gas, then we're going to consume two additional gallons of gas. And so we should be down to 7.5 gallons left in the tank. That's definitely a better test method. We're more thoroughly testing the drive method. We're going to have more confidence that we wrote it correctly. We have two more methods that we wrote in the car class that we have yet to test. We haven't tested the um, get the accessor and the mutator method related to the VIN. Okay? Um, sometimes it's hard to test every method on its own. Like, it's really hard to just test the getVin method without calling setVin first. And how would we test setVin without calling getVin to check if it was set properly? So sometimes for some of these access or mutator method pairs, we write a single test method that tests both. And that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to say at test again. And again, public and void and test setVin. And we will also be testing the getVin method as we, as we write this. So we're going to need to create another test car. We're in a whole new method, so we got to create another car. So new car. Uh, let's just use the default constructor. We don't necessarily need, um, we want to actually make sure we test both constructors, the default constructor as well as the one where we specify the mileage it gets. Uh, we need to create a local variable of type string. So we can create a new string. And this new string is going to be a vehicle identification number I made up. 
you don't have to make it exactly this one. You can have whatever vehicle identification number you want. I think I tried to make that look realistic, like looked at some examples. So Then on the variable test car, which references our new car, we can call the setVin method and pass as the single argument a reference to the string, which is that vehicle identification. But in order to know if this method works, we have to call getVin as well. So we need another local variable, which I'm going to call returnedVin, and we'll assign it the reference that's returned by calling the getVin method. So this is what I mean that we're testing both setVin and getVin within the same test method. And if this test fails, we actually won't know if the issue is with the set or the get but at least we've narrowed it down to one of those two methods. So, not too bad. And we're going to do another assert equals. What value um, do we expect? Well, we expect it to be the string referenced by vin. What value is actually being returned? It's the reference we stored in the variable returned vin. Now we're comparing strings here. We're not comparing floating point numbers. So we don't need that third parameter which specifies how close is close enough. There is no epsilon for strings. We want our strings to be exactly the same. Every letter matches. So we just do assert equals, always the expected first and the actual second. Now we're kind of at a really exciting point. So just to review this process we've been going through of test-driven development, we started by defining all of the methods, but just focusing on the method headers and leaving the bodies empty for now. And then we defined all of the instance variables, the attributes of our class. And then we declared the constructors, but again, we similarly, we left the body empty for now. And then we went off and ran or wrote the test. And we wrote a test method for each and every method in the car class. We're now going to run the tests, and the reason for this is that if we were to write our whole car class, and then we were to write the tests for it, and we were to run those tests and they all pass, that could mean a couple different things. It could mean, hey, we did a great job. We don't have any bugs in our code, and it works. It could also mean there's something wrong with our tests, and they're going to pass regardless of how many bugs we have in our code. And I've seen both. So in, in this unit for the Summative Lab, we're not going to write um, a test class, but we are in the next unit. And sometimes students get the, like, mislead themselves because they've written their tests incorrectly such that they always pass and they never fail. And so it looks like everything is good when it's not. The way we test this is quite simply, we're going to run our tests now. And they should fail because we haven't written any code yet. If they pass, then we should be concerned. Okay? So we're going to switch to the main BlueJay um, project window, and I want you to focus on the, this, this little triangle on the left sidebar at the bottom. Um, and so I'm going to highlight that for you so you can see that. So right here, there's this little triangle. Click on that, and it's going to expose some extra options, some of which relate to testing. Okay. We're going to click on the Run Test button. And this, I mentioned yesterday how much I love JUnit. I love JUnit because we get this test results. We can see at a glance that three of our four tests failed. So that's kind of interesting. We should look into why did the one pass. Um, but what I really like, and yours might be in a different order, but if I click on the test add fuel method, I get this little summary of what failed. It says, hey, assertion error, expected 10.0 but was 0, 0.0. So it actually tells me in a nice English sentence exactly what was expected and what it got. And then I can click on this button here, show source, and it will take to me to the method that failed and highlight the line of code that failed. So I can see like, oh, this is where I was expecting to get have 10 gallons, but it said amount was equal to 0. Well, that's a problem. I'll need to fix that. And that's true of all these. If I click on the test drive one, expected 9.5 but was 0, 
I can click on show source and I can see the line of code that failed there. If I look at the test that passed, um, let's go take a look at that. Here's the test get fuel and tank method. This test passed. And we can see why that is. This was a very basic test. We created a new default car. We called the get fuel and tank method. And we asserted that the, the expected amount was zero and that passed. We shouldn't be too surprised at that because you may remember that we said for instance variables, they are initialized by default to their default value, meaning for a double, it's going to be set to zero. So the fuel in the tank is zero. We kind of got lucky there. Um, maybe that means we should do a better job of making this test more comprehensive. But on the other hand, we call the get fuel and tank method over and over again elsewhere. So I think we're going to have plenty of opportunities to check if it actually works. So I think we'll be OK. Um, but the real thing I wanted you to see today was this test results. Because what this means now is that we can incrementally and iteratively go back to the car class and start implementing the constructors, and then start implementing um, each method. And we can rerun the test step by step until they all pass, at which point we know we're done.